This video is for lecture four. We're going to cover DNA and genes. The learning objectives that we'll cover are here. These are also the same ones in your workbook and the PowerPoint as well. We'll focus on some of these both in the lecture video and in class. Describe the structure of DNA and define the term gene. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's an information molecule that we talked about and it's uh, contained in the nucleus of our cells. And DNA is packaged up, since there's so much of it, so long and so much information, it's packaged and organized into chromosomes. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about chromosomes. You have 23 pairs, or 46 chromosomes, actually 22 pairs and then a, a set of sex chromosomes in females, that's an X pair, and in males, that's an X and Y. And so that's your DNA when people talk about chromosomes, that's just your organized package DNA. And you get your DNA uh, from your parents, your mom and your dad, and you start off as one single cell, which combines 23 chromosomes from dad, 23 chromosomes from mom, and you get a full set of 46. And that founding cell then passes off that same uh, set of 46 chromosomes to all the rest of the cells that form your body. Okay, so what kind of information is actually inside your DNA? What is the information? Well, the information is, is used by your cells to build all the various proteins that the cell can build. So basically, that is the information in your DNA. It's how to build proteins and the correct structure of your proteins. If we think of DNA like a book, uh, the information in that book would be how to build your body's proteins. Remember, proteins are important structure and functional molecules in your body. So in that way, um, DNA, of course, becomes the information book for your body. If we look at the structure of DNA, what is DNA actually made of? A lot of times we'll draw DNA as a ladder or sort of a twisting ladder. Uh, and so um, the twisting ladder is sometimes called a double helix. You probably have heard of that before. And so if we think about, well, what are these actual, what's the ladder made of? Um, so let's build a little bit of DNA and see if we can make sense of this. So if we build, just we'll focus on one, one side of the ladder. And if we do the outer part of the ladder, sort of the structural part, structural part of the ladder, that's made of sugar and phosphate. And the phosphate for DNA, or excuse me, the sugar for DNA is deoxyribose. And then sticking off, making the rung of the ladder, is a nitrogen or nitrogenous base. The phosphate sugar is structural, whereas the base is more for information. And together, that molecule makes up the building block of DNA and RNA called a nucleotide. All right, so that's what forms the ladder, are nucleotides. And we, for DNA, we have just four nucleotides. Just four different nucleotides make up all the information code of your DNA. And so a lot of times we'll just talk about the bases, but what we really mean is that base part of the nucleotide. So here I've kind of color coded them, and since there's only four varieties, we can actually list which these are, and they're color coded also, you'll see on this computer program that we use. So we've got four types of nucleotides for DNA, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine. And that's it. That's the language of your DNA. And sometimes we'll get lazy and we'll just draw them as simple letters. A lot of times we'll just draw the ladder rung and then simple letters representing those bases and the different nucleotides. And a lot of times we'll just list the letters and that's it. But we are hoping you remember that refers to that nucleotide that makes up the ladder and the rungs. All right, and what we've been doing so far is making a single-stranded DNA but DNA usually is found double-stranded. And so how do you make the other rung or the other set of ladder? Well, there's certain rules for making double-stranded DNA. So if we have one side, A, T, A, C, G, we have to follow some rules when we make the other, the other side of the double-stranded DNA. A's always bind to T's, T's always bind to A's, C's bind to G's, and G's bind to C's. And this is because of this chemical bonding and structure of the nitrogenous bases. So if we draw now the double strand, we've got to actually follow these rules. So we put a T and an A and a T and a G and a C. So we went from single-stranded to double-stranded. 
for DNA. This does a couple things. It makes it more stable, but it's also cool. If you ever have to fix your DNA because you lost some of it or damaged some of it, you always know the sequence because you know the rules, right? So we know a T and a G have to go in to fix that portion. We'll talk more about that. If you know one strand, you'll always know the other strand. Again, nucleotides are the building blocks. They're made of a, a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. G's always bind with C's and A's with T's. And again, a lot of times we're just going to write a single strand. We're just going to pay attention to one of the single strands, and we'll write it out just as a letter code. I wanted to show you uh, this website, and you can find that link in Canvas, so that we can actually build the double-stranded DNA. So you see we have a double-stranded on the bottom, but it's only single-stranded on top. So we need to fill in the correct set of, uh, we need to fill in the correct uh, set of nucleotides using our rules to finish the double strand of this DNA. So since there's a T there, it should bind up with an A. And if you follow this along, going a little fast, you can only bind up according to the rules and slowly you grow your double stranded DNA. And so we're going to practice that in class and you're going to practice it in your workbook. But remember, if you know the one strand has an A, then the other double strand has to have a T, and so on. All right, you probably heard the term gene before, but you know what is a gene and what's an easy definition we can think about? Well, again, if we use this book analogy, if the book is your DNA, then all those words are the nucleotides. The words would be the nucleotide sequence, A, T, C, G, G, C, T. All right, so again, a lot of times we'll just look at a single strand of the DNA because the information, um, it's, it's easier that way, and it sort of tells us the same information. So again, what would all those words be in this book, your DNA, the book of you? It would be the nucleotide sequence, all these A's and T's and C's and G's. If we will look at one page or even one paragraph of the book, one section of ATCGs, that one section that has the information for your cells to build one specific protein is a gene. And if we look in different parts of the book, right, we would find different genes. So again, maybe this section is for the gene sequence for your cell to know how to build keratin. And another part of the book has the gene sequence to build a different protein, collagen. So again, the code the ATCGs for a specific protein is what we refer to as a gene. So again, we look at this big mass of information here. One set of sequence of, of uh, nucleotides will be a gene for one protein, and another set of nucleotides will be the information for another protein, so a different gene. All right, and so that's what people mean by a gene. They're really just talking about a sequence of nucleotides. And if some of those nucleotides change, we might call that a mutation. That might lead to making a different or building a different protein because you've changed the information. Some of the ATCGs in our chromosomes are not information used to build proteins at all. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Again, so here we have a couple examples, gene ABC and gene XYZ. Um, we know that the nucleotide sequence for that um, is for one specific protein. Again, we sort of ignore the double strand when we use the one letter code. Uh, don't let that confuse you. And usually your genes will be much longer than what we've shown here, maybe thousands of nucleotides long. So uh, some definitions that you can try to memorize for a gene. A sequence of DNA with the information to build a specific peptide or protein. And again, just instructions to build a protein. Uh, when we talk about the code, we're talking about the ATCGs and their specific sequence. Uh, is DNA a blueprint of the human body? I always seem to have learned that when I was a little kid. And when I think of a blueprint, I think of it sort of as a diagram. And so given what we've just learned about DNA, is it really a diagram? Is it really this sort of map of your body? It's really just ATCGs, nucleotides, in a sequence, and it's this information in there. So I like the better analogy would be that DNA is sort of this book, this book of information, this book of you, uh, and really it's just the book with information to build proteins. And how that all translates into building a human body is still sort of unexplained and still sort of uh, an area of curiosity. Here's a real blueprint, right? A diagram. 
It tells you how to build a plane in this case. So uh, blueprints are neat, but I don't know if that's the best analogy for DNA. Okay, explain the steps involved in transcription and translation. So let's put this DNA to some use. Um, you know, what can we do with DNA? What do your cells do with the information inside of DNA? So that's what we're going to talk about next. The first part we're going to talk about is the process of transcription. So remember, you find your DNA in your cells in a double strand, right? Double stranded DNA is what we usually find. And it has its code, its sequence, A, T, G, C, A. We've just kind of randomly done these. Don't forget, if you know one strand of DNA, you can always follow the rules to fill in the complementary strand. The reason we call it a complementary strand is because uh, one complements the other chemically, right? A's and T's and C's and G's. As long as you follow that rule, you can always build the double strand. So when we actually want to do transcription, we're going to want to photocopy one of those strands. So one of the strands we call a coding strand. The other one we call the template strand. And we're actually going to copy the template strand and make something called RNA, um, which is very similar to DNA, but it can leave the nucleus. And so it's useful in that way since it can be uh, used by the cell's machinery to build proteins. So the enzyme or protein that's going to actually do the, the making and producing of the mRNA is called RNA polymerase. It's just a protein that your cells build, and it can actually uh, help copy DNA and make a complementary strand of RNA. We call it mRNA, messenger RNA. So basically, RNA has a similar phosphate sugar backbone, but the uh, sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose. And we basically build in nucleotides, again, the complementary nucleotides following the rules when we make mRNA. So again, A's and T's, C's and G's, and etc. We have one new rule, and I hope that doesn't confuse you, is when we build mRNA, when your cell builds mRNA, instead of T's, we use U's. And U stands for uracil, which is a nucleotide. So instead of putting in T's in your mRNA, put U's in place of it. So again, uracil is just a nucleotide we find in RNA, and it's in place of T. So again, just one new rule. So we just did transcription. We just built, using the template strand of DNA, we built a complementary sort of photocopy uh, of DNA called messenger RNA. The cool thing about messenger RNA, we just said, is it can leave the nucleus and go out to the cell where we actually build proteins. So there's our mRNA photocopy. And if you notice, it's actually a photocopy of the coding strand. Do you really believe it? We'll compare the nucleotides of the coding strand to your mRNA, and they're all the same except T's are replaced for U's. Okay, now for the next phase, we're going to translate. We're going to basically read that mRNA and build a protein. To do that, we need the ribosome. And the ribosome is a complex of proteins and RNA, and their job is to read the mRNA and build the correct protein based on the sequence of the mRNA. Ribosomes read the mRNA nucleotides in groups of three. Sometimes they're called codons. We're just going to remember in groups of three, we're going to read that nucleotide sequence. Each group of three nucleotides tells the little ribosome to go get a specific amino acid. And by chaining amino acids together, we're going to make a protein. So let's do that. So the ribosome reads the first set of three nucleotides, the uracil, adenine, and cytosine. And it knows if it reads those three letters, those three nucleotides, it should get a tyrosine. Next, it reads the GUC, and it knows it should get, get and connect a valine amino acid. So we're building amino acids by reading the mRNA sequence. And again, that's done by the ribosome complex. For the next one, for the next set of uh, nucleotides, it gets and reads it to translate it to get a serine. And finally, the last set, GUC, that's a repeat of what we saw earlier, that tells the ribosome to connect on a valine amino acid. So we've only made four amino acids here, but we're starting to build a peptide, a protein. And in reality, it would go on and on and build a much longer protein or peptide by reading a longer strand of mRNA. So we just translated mRNA, which is the information from your DNA, and the little ribosome 
understood how to translate it and assemble an amino acid sequence to build the right protein. So that's how you go from information in your DNA to an actual protein. So also think about what happens when your DNA might change, have a mutation, a slight change in the sequence. Will that change what you actually build in terms of protein? Well, if the ribosome reads it and it's different, it might. But in this case, when it reads it, it actually still uses a tyrosine, so it actually didn't cause a difference. And we'll talk about that more in class. Next, I wanted you to think about a couple words, genotype and phenotype. Your genotype is your DNA sequence. Your phenotype is your appearance and your traits. So how are those linked together? Well, it's by the fact that your DNA has the information to make your proteins. Your proteins then uh, affect your structure and function of your cells and your body. So changing some of your proteins by changing some of your genes might make you faster or slower, might make you taller or shorter. Uh, and so throw in environment too, and you can see it's very complex to go from your DNA sequence to your actual physical appearance, which we call your phenotype. The other thing to remember is there are slight variations in our DNA sequences in each of us. And those small little differences might not have any effect or they might have some subtle effects which make us each have our own unique phenotype or appearance. Okay, uh, learning objective three is to determine the correct amino acid sequence encoded in a segment of DNA. So you're basically going to do what we just did there, but with some specific sequences of DNA that I give you in the workbook. So give it a try, and we'll talk more about it in class. Just remember that when you actually uh, create an mRNA, you have to use DNA, you use the template strand, and then once you made your mRNA, we're going to read it, at the nucleotides, in groups of three and go get the right amino acid, depending on the nucleoside sequence. Again, the ribosome does this job. The ribosome reads the mRNA in groups of three and goes and gets the correct amino acid depending on which three letters or which three nucleotides it reads. You can do this as well because you have this table from your textbook. So AUG tells the ribosome to go get methionine amino acid. GUG tells it to go get valine amino acid. CAC tells the ribosome you should connect histidine now while you're making your protein. And the final one, CUG in this example, is leucine. So the one you're going to build in your workbook is going to be slightly longer, but it uses the same rules. The next learning objective is to describe examples of genes and their protein products. I really want to talk about this in class, but let's just do a little bit of an introduction. All the DNA, DNA in your th cells is thought to be able to have information to build about 20,000 to 30,000 proteins. Not all cells build every protein, right? Uh, some of them access certain parts of your information book and become maybe a blood cell and some become a bone cell. So it's kind of interesting. So some examples of genes might be the collagen 1A1 gene which encodes for a protein in structure. Uh, this is sort of a famous gene here, the BRCA gene or breast cancer gene. Uh, it's located on chromosome 17. It's 7,000 nucleotides or letters long and it creates a pretty long protein. A protein that, that is important in your cells for cell growth and division. We all, have this pro we all have this gene and we all make this protein, but some people have a mutation in this gene, so meaning some of their ATCGs are switched up. So when their cells build that protein, their protein's a little different. It doesn't quite function right, and this increases their chance of getting cancer, specifically breast cancer. So this breast cancer gene is sort of interesting in that we all have it, we all have that protein. Uh, we just make the normal protein, hopefully, and we don't get breast cancer. But if we have mutations in that gene, then that can cause increased risk. So again, it's a normal protein that all our cells could make, and some of them make it, in order to regulate cell growth. If it mutates the gene, then the protein's made a little bit different, and those people have then increased risk of cancers, not only breast cancer, but other tissues as well. Okay, the final thing we're going to cover is to review the organization of DNA into chromosomes. We've kind of already talked about this. Our DNA is packaged up and orga organized into chromosomes. Again, we, how many chromosomes do we have? Well, we have 46 chromosomes. We get 23 from one parent and 23 from the other parent. 
our little founding cell has all those 46 chromosomes. Uh, so since you think about it, you have these sets of chromosomes or pairs of chromosomes. So for most genes, you have two copies. I say most because there are some exceptions, especially for males, because we actually have an X and a Y, so there aren't uh, necessarily a pair of genes in that case. We can also determine where and what chromosome the genes are on. That's kind of interesting. So remember, your first little cell, your founding cell called the zygote, has your full complement of 46 proteins, uh, excuse me, 46 chromosomes, and it passes those same 46 chromosomes chromosomes as your cells grow and divide and eventually create the embryo and fetus that is you. So it's kind of weird that all the cells in your body have that same group of DNA, that same information package of 46 chromosomes, most all your cells. All right, we can talk more about that in class. All right, I'll see you guys in class and we'll cover more of this and explain any things you need help with. See you guys.